The saying goes, you should never judge a book by its cover. However, the only reason I picked up good material is because I loved the cover. It's bright and the art drew me in. I figured with a title like good material, it must be about a writer or a comedian who used his life as material. The phrase, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, does seem to be a bit outdated now thanks to marketing and graphic design. I think now we are allowed to judge books by their covers. Breakups. There's nothing worse than the end of a relationship. In this book, the main character, Andy, gets stumped by his girlfriend of four years, Jen. He doesn't understand why. This book follows Andy and his ups and downs during the six months after losing the love of his life. This book is the book I've been reading all year to read. There are so many romances where the two main characters clearly want other things, but they still end up together in the end. However, this book delivered. This book is the millennial anthem. It had so many moments that spoke to my soul. So join me as we dive into the plot, characterizations, and themes of Dolly Adderton's Good Material. The plot of this novel is very straightforward, until the very end of the book. We follow Andy through his breakup from week two till about six months after. In the exposition, we meet Andy, who is going through the worst time. He's 35, he's back living with his mother, and he's just been dumped by the love of his life. Andy does not feel satisfied with the reasons that Jen gave him for breaking up with him. She said that she wanted to be alone and that she didn't know if she wanted a serious relationship at all. To a man like Andy, being alone is about the scariest thing that you could do, so he doesn't accept that as an answer. So instead, he drives himself crazy trying to peer into the mind of Jen. His friend calls it the madness. Andy is not in a great place in his career either. He's a failed stand-up comedian who has just about hit rock bottom. He hasn't made much new material, and he's just stuck in the same pattern instead of trying to grow. It isn't because Andy's given up, but it does feel that on some level, Andy is comfortable and afraid of trying new things. This seems to be the pattern of his life. He doesn't do much self-reflection, so he has not made much growth as a person. He is 35, but according to Jen, it seems like the same person he was when he was 23. As we follow Andy through this breakup, we watch him go from bad to worse. I think my favorite moment is when he decides to live on a boat. Clearly, this is a terrible idea, but he's just desperate not to be a burden to his friends that he jumps into any terrible situation he can get to, and he instantly regrets. This is just one of the terrible decisions Andy makes in the funk that is the first month after Jen. He also buys four bottles of her favorite perfume to dump in the canal. He is constantly cyberstalking Jen. He also goes to a therapist pretending to be Jen, or a male version of Jen, trying to see what her therapist might have said to make her break up with him. All of these things are hilarious for us, the viewer but also so sad. Eventually, Andy finds a new girlfriend who is 12 years younger than him. However, Andy quickly finds out that he's not ready to be in a relationship yet. And unfortunately for Sophie, who seems to be falling for him, he dumps her. Andy also hits the lowest of lows during his career. Not only does his rank drop, making him less money, He gets an article about him written that goes viral. He becomes the face of mediocre white male comedians everywhere. Around this time, Andy goes to a birthday party at his best friend's house, and Jen is there. They reconnect, and Andy thinks that this will be the moment they get back together. But then, he realizes that Jen doesn't want to be in a relationship. This is a hard moment for Andy, but it is also a very important one, probably the turning point. Of this novel. It's in that moment that he evaluates his life and his part in their relationship. He sees that he was putting too much on Jen's shoulders. 
he starts to make some changes in his own life. This is one of my favorite parts of the book, although we don't get to see it through Andy's eyes completely. Andy writes letters to the people in his life in hopes that he can raise his own emotional awareness. He writes a letter to one of his friends who's just been dumped. He also writes a letter to his landlord pretending to be the person he has been writing for years. These changes are wonderful to watch. The climax of this book is Andy's new show, and rudely enough, Adderton leads us to the climax of the novel with Andy and then jumps into Jen's perspective of the events. While I did enjoy hearing Jen's side of the story and laughed at the silly things she did, I didn't really want to pay attention to her storyline. We are so invested with Andy's story that at that point in the novel, Jen's POV was a bit disorienting. We also want to hear Andy's new show. We have an idea of what it's going to be about, and it's something new and different. But I also wanted to know what he said. I wonder if Adderton switched the POV so that we don't get a play-by-play of Andy's show. It was more fun to see it through Jen's eyes instead of Andy's, but I do feel like it's rude to lead to the climax and then backtrack with a new character and their POV. I did love the pacing of this book. It was fun to see the story through Andy's eyes and then swap to seeing all the same things through Jen's eyes. It helps us to confirm all the feelings that we already had and helps us to understand Jen. Andy wanted to know what was going on in her head, and in a twist of dramatic irony, we we're able to see what was going on. It's funny to see how differently they saw the world, but yet these two are so similar. They are both kind, they laugh easily, and they have fun. In the resolution of the book, everyone gets what they need. Jen is able to live her life alone, and Andy is able to find closure in his relationship and put the pieces of his life back together. He is on the right track to find someone new and get the life that he always wanted. There's not much resolution in this story, and I'm not sure if I wanted more resolution or if I just wanted this book to end, but I did feel like the ending was a bit abrupt. Also, we don't get to hear back from the person we spent 90% of the book with, and that's kind of a difficult way to end. However, I do think it was the correct place for the book to end. We see both of these characters have reached a point in their lives, so they are content. So that leads me to ask, what is the main conflict in this novel? I think it's to be summed up in this quote. Breakups can be a good thing, Jane says. They can teach us about who we really are. Yeah, maybe like breakup number one or two, I say. But breakups have depreciating gains. I'm 35 now. I know who I am. I'm already sick of myself. End quote. This book is about how changes in life are scary. And it's okay to embrace that. You might not be 100% yourself. And you might go a bit crazy. But in the end, you have to stay true to who you are at your core. We see this with both Jen and Andy. Andy hadn't really been himself for years. He'd fallen into a comfortable routines of his life, and he didn't want to push himself out of his comfort zone. When he lost Jen, he lost that comfort zone. And now he has to find out who he's like with her gone. Jen knew deep down that she wanted to be alone. It was difficult for her to give up Andy but she knew that being with him was not what she wanted. So the conflict is resolved when each of them have learned the lessons that they need from the breakup. I thought this was an interesting take on romance, and I'll talk more about that later. Andy is clearly the main character in this book. We see his thoughts and ideas throughout the book, which gives us insight into the kind of person Andy is. Andy is a reliable narrator because his thoughts are backed up by other people's actions. There is no holding back, and we are able to know everything that he is thinking. Andy does not think highly of himself. Though he is high charisma, it doesn't seem like Andy is very good at anything. He let Jen love him more than he loved himself, which is a lot to bear. I think the reason I love Andy so much is because he, like me, is an engram three. He cares about how people see him and he craves recognition from those outside himself. Andy's worst fear is to be irrelevant. 
So he does stand-up comedy well after many people would have given up and moved on to something else. This is something I can relate to for certain. I just made a podcast instead of getting up and letting people laugh at me. He's also in a rut. This is something that is relatable to many middle-aged people. It's easy to be comfortable in the life that we live and not give ourselves challenges or try to change. At some point, I think many people think that they're simply too old to change. However, Andy tries to change in a few ways in this book. First, he tries to change his appearance. He gives up carbs and eats high protein and high fat diet. And while he may look great, he realizes that his diet doesn't really make him feel so great. So he starts to make changes that will actually matter. He connects with people around him emotionally and starts making real change. He also tries new things with his comedy, which is something that before the breakup, he wasn't ready to do. Andy's growth in this book was inspirational. And while it may seem like small things, they are difficult things to do. It's hard to take a look at ourselves in the mirror and actively try to be better. Andy saw what he did to Jen after their night back together, and for the first time, he truly understands what he did to Jen and why their relationship wouldn't work. I love this journey, and I hope to read more journeys like this one. Andy is clearly in love with Jen, so all we know about her is given to us with beer goggles. In the book, Andy comes up with a list of reasons why he loves Jen. You have a generous heart. You're a bit too anxious about being being seen to be a good person. I love how quickly you read books. I love that you're always trying to improve yourself. And the list goes on and on. And by the end of this novel, we have a very clear picture of who Andy thinks Jen is. However, from reading Jen's perspective, it is clear that while Andy got most things right, there were just things he couldn't understand about Jen. This could be because she couldn't really give voice to her feelings at the end of her breakup but it also goes to show you that you can never truly know a person. We don't know what is going on in someone else's head, no matter how much time we spend with them. I think Jen was a cool character. You don't see many women who choose to be alone. Being lonely is difficult, but it's clear that for some people, it's what they need to be happy. When Jen was with Andy, she was not truly the person she wanted to be, and she could not be the person he wanted her to be. She's very self-aware, and that's an admirable trait. Sophie was an interesting addition to the novel. I think that Sophie and her friends were a representation of what millennials think about Gen Z. They're sexually ambiguous, and they're trying too hard to be something they're not. I'm not sure if this is an accurate depiction of what Gen Z is actually like, but I do think it captures what many people my age and older think when they see people of this generation post on Instagram and the things we see on TV shows. However, as a person who's taught Gen Z, I see these kids as very similar to how we were growing up. Sure, they're a bit more open-minded and accepting of things that were seen as taboo when I was growing up, but I do not think they are more or less crazy or sexually active than anyone in the past. What did you think of Sophie? Do you think that Sophie and her friends were a good representation of Gen Z? I think that the other characters, while interesting, were not really worth discussing. They were there to be a piece of Andy and Jen's grief and growth while they passed on wisdom and advice. They were stock characters. So we're going to move to my favorite part of the books, and that is the themes and ideas covered in the book. This is a millennial anthem. It has references to The Killers, the 2003 live-action Peter Pan movie, and so much more. Also, the way that the themes in this book were covered spoke to my soul, and I feel like they would have spoken to many of the millennials reading this as well. As someone who's chosen to live a very traditional life, I find it interesting to read about people who choose different lifestyles, but still find happiness. I find myself siding with Andy and his ideas of happiness. However, the more I read about people and their life views, the more I come to understand lifestyles that are different from my own, which is why we read, right? Since this is the last week of Mental Health Awareness Month, I wanted to start by talking about a topic that this book covers so well, and that's grief. According to psychologists, there are five stages of grief. They are 
denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages are not actual stages. You don't go through them in any order, and you often bounce between. This book is a perfect example of that, both with Andy and Jen. First, Andy is living with his mom, and he hasn't accepted that Jen has left him. He believes that Jen will take him back in maybe three or four months. He gets angry, but not really at Jen. He gets angry with himself. He doesn't really have to bargain because he doesn't have anyone to bargain with. He bargains on the fact that they will get back together, but is disheartened when he realizes that never is to be. I would argue that the stage Andy is in a majority of this book is depression. He cannot seem to get out of that stage because he's alone in his pain. He tries to talk to Abby, but Abby doesn't seem to want to listen. All of his friends are in different stages in their lives and they didn't really have time to be sad with him. They also don't know how to have great conversation about emotions, which is something that I will talk to in a minute. Annie cannot get out of his funk because he doesn't know how to. He just drinks a lot, which doesn't seem like the best way to cope, but eventually he figures it all out. It takes his revelation with Jen for him to get into acceptance. He knows that it will never be, and it's not his fault. Jen just didn't want to be in a relationship. She loves Andy, but she was not truly happy or truly herself with him. Once he has this realization, he's able to find a way to move on and find a way out of the madness. However, the lesson I think the author wants us to learn about grief comes from this quote. Getting dumped is never really about getting dumped. What is it about then, I ask? It's about every rejection you've ever experienced in your life. It's about the kids at school who called you names, and the parent who never came back, and the girls who wouldn't dance with you at the disco, and the school girlfriend who wanted to be single when it came to uni, and any criticism at work. When someone says you don't want to be you, you feel the pain in every single one of those times in your life where you felt like you weren't good enough. You live through all of it again. I don't know how to get over it, mom, I say. At this point, I'm so tired of myself. I don't know how to let go of her. You don't let go once. That's your first mistake. You say goodbye over a lifetime. You might not have thought about her for 10 years. Then you'll hear a song or you'll walk past somewhere you once went together Something will come to the surface that you've totally forgotten about, and you say another goodbye. You have to be prepared to let go, and let go a thousand times. Does it get easier? Much, she says. End quote. Grief is not something you can just get over all at once. It is something we carry with us every day. At times, it feels big, but with time, everything feels so much smaller. You don't have to just let it go and walk away all at once. You just have to find a way to move on and be a bit better day by day. I also loved that this book opens with a passage about an elephant grieving and that idea comes full circle at the end of the book with this quote. I've been doing what the elephants do. I've been scattering the bones of us and who we were together. It's kind of a weird morning and kind of a celebration to examine the skeleton of something that was once so magnificent before you scatter all the fragments of it out into the world and say goodbye. End quote. This edition of the book gives it another layer of interest, and it's so beautiful. The elephants mourn is somewhat similar to how we mourn. What did you think about this edition? What insights do you have? I'd love to hear about it in the comments. The next topic this book covers is the idea of relationships. This book explores the need or lack of needing relationships. This seems to be the topic of much of modern literature. Many authors are exploring new lifestyles and families or the lack of families. And I think that Adderton has some interesting thoughts about that. Here's a quote that I think sums it up. Don't have a kid or get married because you're worried about being alone, she said, rubbing my back. I sat upright in my chair, and she held me up by my shoulders. 
Be alone, Jen. You know how to be alone without being lonely. Do you know how rare that is? Do you know how much I wish I could have that? It's a wonderful thing you've got going on there. End quote. Jen is excellent at being alone. This is a skill that not many people have. Most of us would rather be in a relationship or choose not to be lonely. However, Jen finds happiness with herself and is okay being alone. She notes that it's lonely at times, but that's where she's happiest. Adderton notes many times about women who have been forced into relationships in the past and how they didn't make them happy. Jen comes to find that she's happier alone than with Andy. Though being alone is not for everyone, for the first time in history, it's a path that can be chosen for women. Though some fall into it instead of choosing it, the idea that a woman could be happiest by herself is an idea explored in many modern novels I've read. It's not a life that I would choose, but it's a life that can be chosen now, and that is something that can be celebrated. As far as the view of relationships in this book, the idea that was repeated over and over again was the idea that relationships take work. I love this idea because they do. To love someone every day is not an easy task, but something you and your partner agree to do. Women complain about their partners and men complain about their partners, but at the end of the day, they choose to stay together because they chose it. I like that idea far more than being trapped in a relationship because there's not another option. Don't you? Actively choosing your relationship and working together to make it work just feels better than this idea of romantic love that will last forever. This is the idea I want to pass on to my children. Yes, when you fall in love, it's all easy, but relationships are worth working on. Here's some quotes that resonated or capture the idea of relationships being worth the work. I'm sorry that I loved you so much more than I liked myself. That must have been a lot to carry. I'm sorry I didn't take care of you the way you took care of me. I'm sorry I didn't take care of myself either. I needed to work on it. I'm pleased that our breakup taught me that. I'm sorry I went so mental. I love you. I always will. I'm glad we met. Quote two. Relationships are challenging boring and annoying, and that's unavoidable. You have to work through it. You can't just opt out of the whole thing. Quote three, because the person who is in charge of a relationship is the one who loves the least. From these quotes, we see the value of being in relationships and being in relationships where both partners are working towards an end goal. Relationships with partnership, reflection, and growth together is what I think Adderton wanted us to take from this novel. The next idea that is covered in this book is the ability to talk about emotions. Andy is terrible about talking about how he feels and envies the women in his life that can talk so freely and openly. By the end of the book, we see Andy opening up to many of the people in his life. He might do it with letters, but it's clear that he goes from being unable to think outside of himself to developing real connections with the people in his life. I loved watching this change in him. I think that becoming a good friend is a great first step to becoming someone's partner again. Speaking of partnership, I love the idea of joining worlds. Here's a quote that Andy says that just resonated with me. And then we met and fell in love and we introduced each other to all of it, like children showing each other our favorite toys. The instinct never goes away. Look at my fire engine. Look at my vinyl collection. Look at all these things I've chosen to represent who I am. It's fun to find out about each other's self-made cultures and make our own hybrid in the years of eating, watching, reading, listening, sleeping, and living together. Our culture was drinking tea from very large mugs, looking forward to the Glastonbury tickets day and the new season of Game of Thrones and taking the piss out of ourselves for being just like everyone else. Our culture was tipping in restaurants because we both used to work in the service industry, salty popcorn at the cinema, and afternoon naps. I love this quote because it's such a great way of explaining relationships. The idea of love that's presented in this novel is just so great. And being able to talk about your feelings of love and how you're scared 
is how you overcome and find that perfect relationship. I absolutely love this novel. Every romance I've read this year, I've been waiting for the moment where the couple just ends it all, and this book delivered. I'm not sure why it's so satisfying, but here we are. I rated this book 5 out of 5 stars for simply that reason. It broke all the norms of romance and gave us insight into the world of middle-aged millennials. Yes, Andy does wind his way through this novel, but the journey for me was worth the winds. I hope you enjoyed this book as much as I did. Thank you for listening to this episode of According to Your English Teacher. If you liked this episode, please give the channel a review. It would mean the world to me. I would also love to hear your thoughts on the book, so make sure you leave a comment in the comment section. Did you love this book as much as I did, or were you mad that they didn't get back together? Also, if there's a book you would like to hear me break down, let me know. I'd love to review books that we've all read and we can discuss together. I'd like to close with a quote that I think encapsulates this whole thing. And yes, I know I said it already, but here we are. Breakups can be a good thing, Jane says. They can teach us about who we really are. This episode of According to Your English Teacher was written by me, Sam Gunther, and edited by Dallin Gunther. Please join me next week as we discuss the book, Berry Pickers. Thanks for listening and happy reading.